Right. So my theory doesn't work. When you're up here, it's not a work. Don't step you have to back. Yeah. See? These two. These two. This is the front part. Not to get this. Oh. Oh. Okay. So don't stay there. there. Just come back over here. And does Wilson need the mic? Mine? No, the hand mic? That's for you. Yeah, does Wilson need it? He's going to be here. Okay. When you're doing your individual introductions, yeah. you're going to be coming from over there. Okay. But I'm, do oh, I'm doing the general. I'm doing the general one here. Yes. Okay. We're using just the overview here, then I'll, I'll yes. take it out. This is live. Can I come? Pass the mic down. So I need the mic as soon as you leave the stage. Okay. No urgency. Which is why we're saying I'll take it back. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to the 2024 3MT competition. Please mute your phones. Our Master of Ceremonies today will be Dr. Carl Kumaradas, Interim Vice Provost and Dean of the Yates School of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. Before we begin, the land acknowledgement will be given by Dr. Wilson Lung, Director of the Graduate Leadership Institute. Abe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. The dish, or sometimes it is called the bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario, from the Great Lakes to Quebec, and from Lake Simcoe into the United States. We all eat out of the dish, all of us that share this territory, with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. Importantly, there are no knives at the table, representing that we must keep the peace. Recognizing where we stand is not to historicize the experiences of Indigenous peoples or to offer platitudes but it is one of many intentional acts to acknowledge injustice and to commit ourselves individually and collectively as a university community to the path of truth and reconciliation. It is also a reminder that we are all accountable to these relationships. Thank you. I'm gonna pass the now, time now to Dr. Carl Kumaradas. All right. Thank you, Wilson, for that. Much appreciated. So uh, thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, showing your support for the uh, presenters we have here today. I'm quite excited uh, by this three-minute thesis competition. Um, I've always enjoyed being here as a member of the audience and uh, especially excited since this is my first time um, hosting this event. So um, as you uh, know, uh, the three-minute thesis competi competition is a university-wide competition uh, where they present their research and its impacts in three minutes to non-specialists. The challenge is to explain complex research in an accessible and engaging way using only one slide. Right. So um, I'd like to start off by uh, welcoming our panel of judges. Um, again, uh, non-specialists in your area of research, um, so keep that in mind, obviously. Uh, our first uh, member I'd like to, uh, panel member I'd like to welcome is uh, Sean Keraj, who is uh, TMU's uh, Vice Provost Academic and an Associate Professor of Canadian and Environmental History. His research examines a range of topics. In Sean is the author of Inventing Stanley Park, an Environmental History for which he won the Canadian Historical Association Clio Prize for Best Book in British Columbia History, and is co-editor of Traces of the Animal Past, Methodological Challenges in Animal History. Thank you, Sean, for being here. Our uh, se second panel member 
uh, is Janet Koprivnikar, who is the Interim Associate Dean of Programs at the Yates School of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at TMU. Janet stepped, has stepped into my role while I'm Interim Dean, so thank you again, Janet, for, for stepping in. Janet is a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biology, conducting research in the area of disease ecology, and was the Acting Associate Dean of Research and Innovation in the Faculty of Science during the 2022-23 academic year. Janet has authored more than 70 peer-reviewed publications and supervised over a dozen graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. Thank you, Janet, for being here. And our th third uh, uh, panelist is uh, Angela Misri. She's a Toronto journalist and a novelist who worked at the CBC for 14 years be before becoming the digital director for The Walrus. She writes for many different media groups, including The Globe and Mail, CBC, The Walrus, and Global TV, and is the author of seven novels. Angela is currently an assistant professor in the School of Journalism at TMU, and her research includes the ethics of using AI to create journalism and its effect on newsroom work. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> of course, I want to thank our presenters who have worked very hard on their presentations. Today we have 21 presentations, which I am sure will be excellent. To uh, give you an idea of what to expect, the three-minute thesis rules are as follows. And again, the presenters are aware of this, and this is for the rest of the audience for your information. Participants can use only one static slide. That means no animation, no other media or, or props are allowed. As the name implies, presentations are limited to a maximum of three minutes. Participants will be able to see a countdown timer and will be given a 30-second warning. Competitors exceeding three minutes will automatically be disqualified. Keep that in mind. Lastly, the uh, judges' decisions um, in, in terms of the winner are final. The uh, presentations will be judged equally on comprehension, engagement, and communication. The first place winner will receive $1,000 and an all expenses paid trip to Lakehead University's dollars, and a 250 participants choice award will also be given. So with that, let me introduce the first of our present presenters. So I'd like to, let me just switch mic so I can get out of the way for you. Can you hear me okay? All right. So I'd like to uh, introduce Adrienne Bouzaid, uh, who is, uh, who's doing her master's MRP in the graduate program of interior, interior design and being supervised by Viola Ago. Her presentation title is AI, the future of design. Let me take you on a journey into the future, a future where artificial intelligence and human creativity intertwine to redefine the world of design. Picture this, AI and designers working hand in hand, much like a dynamic duo, each bringing the unique strengths to the table. It's a bit like Batman and Robin, AI being a trusty sidekick equipped with incredible computational power, while designers take on the role of the visionary leader guiding the process with their expertise and intuition. Designers and architects begin by understanding the client's needs and vision, followed by initial design concepts and plans that can take weeks, months, and sometimes years to complete. As for the client, this process can be very daunting and time-consuming, waiting to hear back from the designer or architect. And as for the designer, there are a multitude of mundane, repetitive tasks that need to be done before executing the project. That's where my research is. I've been delving deep into the relationship between AI and designers to see how they can work together to revolutionize the world of design. I started by collaborating with ChatGPT giving it a baseline and describing my ideas more elaborately. I then took that description and fed it into an AI image software, also known as Midjourney, creating visuals that inspired new ideas and directions to my projects. This process, I then created my projourney. This process continued with each iteration, refining and expanding upon the previous one. I then create, I'm continuing my research by exploring different ways AI can be used in the design process, ultimately making the start to finish time more efficient than it's ever been done before. And you, as the client, receive exactly what you want and more at a record speed. This means going into various AI tools and technologies like digital design algorithms and predictive analytics to see how we can make the design process more creative, efficient, and innovative. You see, I'm here to prove that AI isn't here to replace us. It's here to aid us. 
by leveraging AI's computational power, we can valuable time for mundane tasks, allowing designers to do what they do best, creating. And the result? Well, there's nothing short of revolutionary. With AI, we can explore new design possibilities, experiment with unconventional ideas, and unlock new levels of creativity that were previously unimaginable. Let's embrace AI as a powerful tool for innovation and creativity, and together, let's shape a future where humans and AI become their own superhero duo. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Adrienne. Um, I was wondering how long it would take before I heard ChatGPT in a presentation. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, thank you for that. And AI is very pervasive, and we're learning more and more about it. And I'm uh, excited to hear uh, the various ways of using AI. So thank you for that. Uh, our next presenter is Sama Abdulela. Uh, Sama is doing her master's thesis in the Electrical and Computer Engineering program um, under the supervision of Dr. Rasha Kashef. And her presentation title is Cyber Security Using Generative AI. Imagine you check your credit card statement and find charges for things you definitely did not buy. Did you know that cybercrime cost the world around $8 trillion in 2023? That's over $250,000 every second and it's predicted to rise to $10.5 trillion by 2025. Cyber criminals are making use of artificial intelligence, or AI, to enhance their hacking skills. And it's not just money they're after. These cyber criminals are also targeting your personal your address and social insurance number. So how can we protect our financial assets and personal information from falling into the wrong hands? My research aims to build an effective AI model for cybersecurity. Our model is a software program that can make use of historical network data to learn and efficiently detect network attacks. But this can be challenging. Sometimes we don't have enough data to train our model. More specifically, we often have more regular traffic than attacks. So the model actually does not learn enough about the attacks. How do we solve this problem? We use Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs, which work like a competition between a thief and a police officer. The thief, or generator, tries to make things that seem real, like fake money, while the police officer, known as the discriminator, tries to distinguish real from fake. They compete until the thief gets really skillful at making things look real, making it harder for the police officer to spot the fake. Using GANs, we generate fake attack data to help train our model alongside real data. Then our model becomes better at spotting network attacks, even ones that it has not seen before. Using generative AI enhances the security of our internet connected devices and protects us from both known as well as emerging network attacks. Our model can be applied in many domains, such as medical systems, as well as financial institutions. So, if you knew that our AI model has been deployed into your bank network, you wouldn't worry anymore about the security of your transactions and funds. You can sleep tight and be assured that your security is our priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samar. Um, glad to uh, hear that uh, we don't have enough data of thieves stealing our uh, money for my accounts and that we are we have these fake thieves to practice the security of that so uh, that was quite a relief to hear that thank you um, our next presenter is uh, Zara Motajola uh, Zara is uh, doing PhD uh, in computer science um, under the supervision of Dr. Helena Misic Her presentation is titled using drones to provide connectivity to autonomous vehicles in challenging environments experience waiting 20 minutes for Uber and when you go to a long road trip to the north and you struggle connecting to the internet to do your work. I really feel you. These days internet is like water and food for people and people cannot imagine living without it. As a super trending technology, autonomous vehicles also execute their functionality based off surrounding network. So what about people wants to use those autonomous vehicles in the challenging environment with those connectivity issues? 
So it's good to note that the autonomous vehicles market size is estimated to hit 2.3 billion US dollars by 2032. So definitely it's worth to work on it. And that's where my project comes in. In my project, I'm going to design a supportive alternative network infrastructure that help the autonomous vehicles overcome their challenging for the connectivity in the challenging area, like the remote location or the location in the middle of dense buildings. So in this project, we have a special guest, autonomous drones, that they can fly everywhere we want in the challenging area and provide that supportive network. And this is re gonna reduce the cost significantly because we don't have to pay a large amount of money to install a very large traditional network antenna in the remote location that the demand of internet is very low. And the advantage of, of our model is that we are using a kind of network protocol which names LoRa. And this protocol is free, so we don't have to subscribe and pay for it. And it can work perfectly fine along, so don't worry. When they are flying in the sky, they don't get bother. You don't even see them. And at the end, we all have a live connected. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Zara. Um, speaking of challenging environments and Uber, I don't know if your research will solve this problem, but I was waiting for an Uber the other night in the rain, in the pouring rain, and the drivers kept canceling on me and uh, waited 15 minutes before somebody finally came to pick me up. Um, anyway, so looking forward to solutions to that problem. Our uh, uh, next competitor, number four, is uh, Jenny Leung. Uh, Jenny is doing their master's thesis. Uh, Oh, Jenny's not here. Okay. No Jenny. Next up. All right. Well, way ahead of schedule. This is good. <laughs> Moving on to competitor number five. Um, Yazaman uh, Ahmadiyadli uh, is uh, doing a PhD dissertation in the uh, graduate program of electrical and computer engineering, being supervised by Dr. Naimul Khan and Dr. Stephen Zhang. And her presentation title is Deep Fake The Mirage of Reality. <laughs> because they are. Deepfakes are becoming more and more present in our daily lives, whether social media platforms or news outlets. And distinguishing between the fake and real is becoming harder. When we uh, consider celebrities and politicians because of their public image, there is a chance that you will give it a second thought when you are seeing a president swearing in public TV. You will think like, okay, maybe this is manipulated, not real. But what about ordinary citizens, me? These are all deep fake images of me that I created with a basic face swapping algorithm. This algorithm is very basic and it just basically swapped my face with the face of that subject. But you can see that it looks realistic and this is where the challenge of deep fakes are becoming real. Now, when uh, deep detection models are being trained on data sets, these data sets are mainly celebrities and politicians. And these detection mod models eventually learn the identities of these data sets. But when it comes to ordinary citizens, they struggle to distinguish between the fake and the real person. This is where my research comes into play. I'm working on a multimodal deepfake detection model that can focus on detecting the fake and real without the subject identity. So it's identity independent. How does it do that is that my model uses the structural features of modalities such as audio and videos and uses these features and the loss function, which in this loss function, I force my model to use the cues present in the fake content to do the classification. Now, what are the cues? Cues are things present in fake content that are generated in the process of deepfake generation. No matter how good the deepfake generation is, it leaves some cues behind. And I'm forcing my model to use these as the classification uh, criteria. My research aims to safeguard the identity of ordinary citizens such as me and you. And also by deploying this model into industrial applications such as social media platforms and also news outlets, I aim to bridge the gap between the industrial applications and the research community. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Yasaman. Um, I have to say the... Uh the picture of the Pope in a puffer jacket is my favorite deep fake. I don't know why. I think it's great. And I do see some pictures of myself as a teenage boy, and I think they're deep fakes as well. <laughs> they must be. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ua Zeng. Uh, Ua is uh, doing their master's uh, MRP project in Immigration and Settlement Studies, uh, supervised by Dr. Amina Jamal. Um, the title of their presentation is The Experiences of Chinese Immigrant Masseuses in Toronto.
What impacts your well-being at work? Is it how safe you feel? Is it advocating for yourself freely? These type of privileges are like a pair of shoes that help you navigate a work environment. What if I told you that many racialized immigrants do not have that pair of shoes to feel safe or speak out against exploitative working conditions? And this is often due to their precarious immigration status. As a Chinese immigrant woman, I want to explore how Canadian immigration policies and the devaluation of labor influence the legal status and working conditions of Chinese immigrant masseuses in Toronto. I hope through exploring their experiences and work in this field, we can learn the knowledges that can be transferable to other vulnerable and marginalized groups working in Toronto and Canada as a whole. I will recruit the nine participants to conduct semi-structured interviews. My interviews will focus on three areas of these women's experiences, working conditions, health impacts, and coping strategies they use. In discussing their working conditions, I will ask them how they pay for the work in the massage parlor. Jun Young Kim. Uh, Jun Young is doing their master's thesis in a graduate program that I think I recognize physics um, under the supervision of Aidan Brown. I'm from physics. Um, his title is Imposter Proteins, Catch Me If You Can. Proteins is key for our health. It is our frontline defender in fighting off sickness and building strong muscle. I don't have strong muscle to show you. <laughs> when I say protein, you might think of tofu, pork, beef, chicken, or other consumables. But I'm here to talk about protein is inside our body that help ourselves to do their work properly. Proteins with their diverse shape move inside the cell and find a spot where they can work properly. Did you know that in order for proteins to work properly, they have to fold it into the correct shape? This leads to an interesting question. What happens to the protein that I folded incorrectly? This incorrectly folded protein are imposter protein that acts like a uh, folded protein, correctly folded protein. They still can move around inside a cell, but they're not able to do the work as correctly folded protein. Well, not only that, this imposter protein are also causing trouble to the cell. If you have enough, many enough imposter protein in your cell, it can cause some diseases, such as cancer. Our cell are imposter proteins. They'll send out detected proteins to hunt down this imposter protein, like the game of Catch Me If You Can. It is unclear how these detected proteins catch this imposter protein. So what we do is we investigate how these, these uh, detected proteins catch this imposter protein and how can we help them to speed up. So once we're able to understand how the detected proteins can catch this imposter protein, we can further figure out how we can speed up this process and preventing the diseases leading by imposter protein, and ultimately preventing cancer from happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen Young. Um, I don't think I cared more about proteins and how they folded until SARS, um, until COVID happened uh, with the SARS virus and the spike proteins, and that became an interesting topic for me. So uh, we, we're going to take a break now. Um, we're a bit ahead of schedule. Uh, Ten minutes from now, we'll uh, continue on with the presentations. I think this is a good chance for the presenters that have already presented to finally go and eat something for lunch. So take that chance.
Okay, everyone. So uh, let's continue with the with the session. No rush. We have time. Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our next presenter, uh, Meng Lu Li, who is uh, doing their PhD in electrical and computer engineering um, under supervision again uh, with uh, Dr. Steve Zhang. Their present title, uh, presentation title is Can We Trust What We Hear? And now I don't know what to do with your presentation, but we'll see. <laughs> The voice on the other side sounds exactly like hers, asking for a $1,000 to her new bank account. Would you trust what you hear and make the transfer? This can be fraud using voice conversion technology, where the voice are manipulated to mimic someone else's, including their speech patterns, accents, and emotional expression. Even famous people like Joe Biden and Taylor Swift have both been the victim of this fake audio fraud. Specifically, Voice conversion fraud can be more easily achieved over the phone. Since the voice signals are often compressed, which can introduce a distortion that humans cannot detect. This undoubtedly raises the threat to the institutions that rely on voice authentication, such as bank, call center, as well as our everyday phone conversation. To combat this issue, my research aims to develop a powerful tool to detect AI-generated audio. My method consists of three steps. Step one. I break the audio into small segments. Step two, vocal features like tone and pitch are extracted. Step three, our detection model, which utilizes the deep neural network, analyzes the vocal features and assigns a score to each of the segments based on signs of spoofing. One thing to highlight is, during the entire process, we decrease audio quality to replicate a realistic phone condition. Unlike those typical detection models that only tells you the audio is fake, not without explaining why, my model not only gives you a definitive detection result, but also highlights the most suspicious part of the audio, which makes my result more trustworthy. On the slide, here is one sample detection result of a spoof data. The intensity of the background color corresponds to the degree of spoofing. More red means it's more likely fake. Therefore, you will understand how and why an audio is a fake one. We are racing against those algorithms that create fake audio. We aim to develop a strong tool that can employ anywhere in our daily life to protect our daily life. With this tool, you can confidently trust every call from your mom and your loved ones. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Meng Lu. Uh, uh, as we can see uh, with AI and generative AI, that uh, there's a lot of uh, things being produced, audio, text, video, uh, pictures that are fakes, and uh, it's an important topic to try and uh, get a handle as to what's real and what's not. So thanks for your work on that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Yishen Li. Uh, Yishen is doing their uh, PhD in uh, management at the Edgewood uh, under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Ravi Akrapu, and the title is Can You Hear Music? Computer Cultural Taste in the Wild. I have gotten a huge for the goods, what's really taste? I'm an expert to diversify the taste or an exporter who's a more exclusive taste. A music festival typically has multiple events, some of which take place simultaneously. It's a nice to get in the recommendations that cater to your height, so you don't have to feel overwhelmed or worry about opportunity costs in the raw attention economy. Against this back of acting up in my PhD dissertation research on the world renowned Berkeley University of Denmark. By the way, previous lines were Paul McCartney, Dylan, Dua Lipa, Bruno Mars, name a few. On the one hand, festival goers use the official app to check in, generate massive location data, you know, latitude, longitude, roughly speaking, we know their whereabouts. On the other hand, I'm collecting music data such as genres from the festival's official playlists on Spotify. My research question is, what, if any, is the association between festival goers, music taste similarity, and location similarity? You know, people prefer to befriend others who share similar cultural tastes, aesthetic values, or lifestyles, hence the adage, birds of a feather flock together. To address this question, I harness state-of-art AI to create a map illustrating the cultural distances, if you will, between all the festival goers, such as roads with similar tastes are nearby, and vice versa. Let me give you a more concrete example. A quote-unquote mainstreamer is someone who has a rather short average cultural distance from others, exploiting mainstream genres, say, pop music. A so-called novelty seeker is the exact opposite, experiencing niche genres like independent music. 
Lo and behold, exploring several round rocks does not necessarily mean diversity seeking, as they can be homogeneous. A die-hard diversity seeker craves round rocks that are far apart in terms of cultural distance, such as classic music and electronic music. Drawing on my research insights, event management can build a smart chatbot powered by ChatGPT in this checking app to compute your cultural taste on the fly, make tailored recommendations, or even add a bit of serendipity to your journey instead of blindly suggesting the most popular events. In a nutshell, not only does my research shed light on exploration vis-a-vis -vis exploitation in cultural consumption, be it music, movies, or books, but also contributes to a new science of culture and entertainment. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Yixing. Yixing. Um, culture and music, so we're ahead of time. And uh, I promised the staff that I wouldn't tell stories, but I can. <laughs>
we want our system to be just as knowledgeable, but with a fraction of the human involvement. So we'll give our system a preliminary task that doesn't require human input, but can teach it valuable skills, such as ordering a set of shuffled video clips. This may seem irrelevant, but consider that of all the courses you've ever taken in your life, very few of them actually relate to your thesis, but they've all taught you something. And knowing the repetitive and ordered nature of assembly line actions, we can, without supervision, detect the patterns and use these to inform our model. A really good supervisor is flexible to the evolving needs of their lab students. Our AI can actually improve as companies are using it. Knowing that our failures teach us more than our successes, the AI can identify, based on confidence, which examples it struggles with, and only for these are the human supervisors asked to help. And once it becomes an expert, it can focus on helping the workers. In this way, our system is a super supervisor. It is always available, able to provide feedback, and is watching out for you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for Christopher. Um, I'm a bit more worried about my job now with that presentation. Uh, but all the best to you. Okay, our uh, uh, next, I get to go? Okay. Our uh, next spe speaker is uh, Marcia Hahn. Uh, Marcia is doing their PhD in Environmental Applied Science and Management under the supervision of Dr. Bala Venkatesh. Um, and the title of their presentation is Detecting Electricity Consumption Anomalies. How many gigabytes is streaming a standard version, a standard definition movie? How about downloading a typical 300 page book? Today, these answers are roughly and intuitively known. One to two gigabytes per movie and 20 megabytes for book. Indeed, we're all aware of our digital footprint because we want to ensure that we're not penalized with costly overconsumption. Now, how about your electricity footprint? Do you know how much your refrigerator consumes on an hourly, weekly, monthly, yearly basis? How about your microwave, toaster, computer, washing machine, television? Generally, the answer is no, I do not know. Many people have no idea what their electric consumption footprint is and thus take it for granted. Thus, they are less capable to make vital energy saving decisions. In my research, I seek to find a way to, al to alert consumers of anomalies in their consumption and to pinpoint which appliance is the culprit. Right now, we're experiencing a mega shift in electricity uh, generation and consumption, whereby we will be known as prosumers. That is the ability to both consume and produce electricity. This, this is possible through individual renewable energy technologies such as solar and wind in combination with batteries and working with smart meters. Thus, transforming the electricity grid into a smart grid. With greater abilities, it is ever so essential that everyone understand their electricity consumption patterns, not only for personal economic reasons, but so too for global climate change reasons. The approach I'm taking to identify the appliances causing the anomaly is done by leveraging artificial intelligence and smart meters in time series. Artificial intelligence is currently experiencing a mega, mega explosion in, uh, in, in creativity, and whereas time uh, series is based on the, well, <laughs> okay, uh, through, through, ident through notifying all the users about their energy consumption patterns, especially when there is an anomaly, we give them the ability to make better and greener electricity consumption choices. Indeed, we're giving the power of choice to the people, the choice to save money, the search to save energy, and the choice to save the planet. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Marcia. This uh, reminds me of the um, electrical engineering is my undergrad. Uh, the debate with my wife about uh, the, the money we're wasting by keeping the light on in that room. Uh, and not turning it off when we leave. So uh, those smart meters would be helpful for that, for that argument. Um, 
Our uh, next uh, presenter is uh, Mabu Marbube Asadi, who's uh, doing the uh, PhD in mechanical and in industrial engineering under the supervision of Dr. Sajad Saidi and Kurush Zarenia. The title of their uh, work, uh, the presentation is Collaborative Robots. The world has changed a lot in the past few years, reminding us of a future where autonomous uh, robots can work closely together to make our life safer and easier. Did you know that a robot, a rescue robot named Emily, saved more than 240 refugees in its only first 10 days of deployment alone? And it is saving lives every day all over the world. This feat alone showcases the incredible potential robots have uh, that positively can impact our life. In my PhD research, I work on a group of collaborating robots that can explore, interact with, and experience their environment as a collective much faster than a single robot acting alone. And if we do this in a distributed manner and one robot fails, the whole system can continue without any problem. One of the challenges in multi-robot uh, and especially in rescue robots is that the dynamic, the environment is highly dynamic and we unpredictable. So learning-based technique here is beneficial. Why? They are fast, efficient, and um, flexible. So I, I developed the first fully distributed uh, multi-robot system that can um, map the environment in 3D and in real time. So let's consider these two robots exploring the chair. One robot only sees the back of the chair and one robot only sees the front. They don't send any pictures to each other, only the learned values. In the end, they both have a perfect 3D model from this chair. So next time, when you are considering multi-robot rescue operation, don't think of it as uh, when they have to send pictures, uh, videos, voice messages. No, just with uh, coincise numerical data, they will um, promptly send a message to all the robots saying uh, there is an alert here and then they will share um, and then they uh, adjust their uh, action accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mabube. Um, very impressed to hear about this robot that saved uh, 20 lives um, by itself and so uh, a huge potential when you get them to collaborate and, uh, and work together. So very exciting work there. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Jordan Carrillo Zureira, Zureta. Sorry. Uh, Jordan is doing their PhD uh, in molecular science under the supervision of uh, Dr. Derek Rousseau. And their presentation title is Building Better Processed Foods Block by Block. Were you ever told not to play with your food? Because as a food scientist, playing with foods is my job. I see foods the same way that I see Lego, with each ingredient being its own building block that I put together to create new foods. Take peanut butter, for example. Peanut butter in its simplest form is made from peanuts that are ground into a paste, giving you a spread of peanut solids and their released oil. Do you know what the worst part of opening a jar of natural peanut butter is? Well, for me, it's when you open the jar and you see a layer of oil sitting atop the solids. Try remixing that. This separation of the oil and solids occurs as the solids want to sink to the bottom of the jar. Now, producers prevent this separation by using additives like fully hydrogenated vegetable oil, which will thicken the peanut butter and slow down the sinking solids. 
This addition also gives you a smooth variety of peanut butter, my personal favorite, which has a spreadable texture and long shelf life. Hydrogenated vegetable oils are a common thickener in many processed foods, but they are high in saturated fats and consuming them increases your risk for heart disease and stroke. All of us here have loved ones to take care of, so taking care of ourselves by watching what we eat is important. But I get it, health foods don't satisfy the same as junk foods. Well, I'm here to say that maybe we can have our smooth peanut butter and spread it too. For my project, I wanted to rebuild processed foods like smooth peanut butter, replacing thickeners high in saturated fats with nutritious, protein-rich building blocks. When I think of proteins, I think of health and building muscle. But proteins are also used to build foods. Proteins are shaped like spheres, but when we heat them, they unravel and stretch out their arms, connecting to each other to thicken our foods. We see this occur in dairy foods like cheese and yogurt, where whey proteins provide this effect. So why not try it in peanut butter? Data from my lab has shown that whey proteins can thicken peanut butter models, slowing down this oil-solid separation without the need for saturated fats. We hope to take the same approach and use plant-based proteins too, so that our technique can be used in all sorts of foods and be accessible to people with all sorts of diets. In playing with peanut butter, I have outlined how we can rebuild better processed foods, block by block, bad fats to no fats, and protein by protein. The next time that you all bite into a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I hope it packs a protein punch without the hard hitting fats. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Um, feeling bad now, true story. My breakfast of choice is Obama's breakfast of choice, I heard, peanut butter and honey on toast. I did buy the natural peanut butter once and it separated and it was a pain to mix it. I gave up and I've gone to the favorite spreadable brand I won't mention as well, now I'm sad. But my son actually has protein powder because he's, he's a gym rat need, so I, I might you know, mix it up. Okay, good to know, thank you. Um, our uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Sarah Chatta, um, who's doing their master's thesis in chemical engineering um, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Simant Upreti and Dr. Philip Chan. Their presentation title is AI and Liquid Crystals, the Future of Homo. Now, before I begin, I would like to take a second and apologize in advance if you start seeing me excessively starting to sweat, or if I sound a little nervous. Because to be honest with you all, I may or may not have been a little stressed out preparing for this. Who else here finds themselves stressed out? Do you find that you're more stressed during certain times of the day, or even certain days of the week? I know for me personally, Sunday evenings are a little more stressful as I prepare for the week ahead. Cortisol is a steroid hormone, also known as the stress hormone. And when our body undergoes stress, whether it be from something physical, like going to the gym, or emotional stress, the brain releases cortisol into the bloodstream. Now, abnormally high or low levels of cortisol can cause some serious health issues. For example, irregular blood pressure, heart disease, extensive weight gain, and even mental health disorders, like depression and anxiety. And so typically, to get cortisol levels measured, you need to go through a time-consuming and lengthy process of getting blood work done. Ugh. So that involves getting a requisition from your doctor, going to get the actual blood work done, and then waiting for the follow-up appointment, which, in my opinion, is a pretty stress-inducing process in itself. And not to mention, if you are afraid of needles, that might not work so well for you either. My research aims to use liquid crystals to serve as an indicator of cortisol levels in the body in real time using saliva. The display devices we use on a daily basis, like our phones and the TV, are usually made up of these liquid crystals. And the really cool thing about them is that they're extremely sensitive to external stimuli. So whether that be the electric voltage, in the case of the display devices, or chemical or biological agents, like cortisol. 
The goal is to use artificial intelligence to predict both the chemical and the physical interactions between liquid crystals and cortisol, and then use this to simulate data to design a real-time, non-invasive sensor. The idea uses the optical properties of liquid crystals, and depending on the concentration of cortisol found in the saliva, the liquid crystals can actually show methods. Having the ability to measure cortisol levels in real time can provide us with an overall snapshot of our hormonal health and can also serve as a reminder of when we may need to take action. These things could be as simple as reducing our caffeine intake, which may be hard for some, increasing our nutrient-dense foods in our diet, or by simply spending some time outdoors by going on a walk. It can also help us in taking a step back and evaluating our life for some key stressors to not only improve our hormonal health, but our overall quality of life. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sarah. Um, if, you have, if you had a device here, you might have a good sample of people with stress levels here to test it on, right? Um, so we, with that, we'll take another break, um, another 10-minute break. We're ahead of schedule, but that's all fine. And uh, mingle, the, rest, the second ha third of you can go now and eat, right? <laughs> And the last third, you gotta wait a bit more.
because somehow like um, I'm paid after this. Yeah. So I'll take the trip. Yeah. 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 You did a great job, by the way. Okay, we'll uh, get started in a couple of minutes. Okay, in uh, two minutes.
Okay. On to our last set of uh, presenters. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Christopher Scarpone, who's doing their PhD in Environmental Applied Science and Management under the supervision of uh, Dr. Andrew Millward. And uh, the title of their presentation is The Crisis in Our Forests, The Change We Need to See. Hi, today I present to you a seed. This is not a physical seed that I can hand to you, but it is a seed that you can take. It is a seed that I hope once you take it and you plant it, your knowledge will grow. Before I could tell you what this seed is, I have to tell you how I came to this seed. It came from a love of trees. As a boy, I would go into the forest and watch the seasons change, the forest around it. Over time, I started to see that this change was affecting our forest, both big and small. Now, the problem with that was this change wasn't for the good. Our forests are actually in crisis. Currently, rapid urbanization is causing fragmentation for our forests. Forest fires are becoming larger and more frequent year after year. We're seeing more pests and we're losing much of the needed biodiversity that is keeping our forests resilient. From this, I knew I had to do something, and I wanted to know how can I understand this change? So I embarked on my journey, and seven years later through my PhD, this is some of the work that I will present to you. My thesis brought me to Tommy Thompson Park in, the, in Toronto, Ontario. In this park, I met this very interesting and special bird, the double-crested cormorant. Double-crested cormorants are an important part and critical part of our ecosystems. They bring external nutrients in to an area and they open up canopy to allow revitalization into our forests. Now, going back to this crisis, humans have caused this process to move out of flux. These birds are causing a lot of issues with regards to deforestation. I embarked on this journey to collect soil samples, to take tree surveys, to collect height, canopy sizes, and I used various tools such as drones, satellites, and airplanes to collect information about this forest. One data set in particular is a LiDAR point cloud. LiDAR is a laser that is emitted and it bounces off an object and it is collected. Usually that object, being something like a tree, can be captured in a 3D environment. If we fly this uh, LiDAR over a plane, we can collect our entire forest. With this, I can understand what is the morphology of the forest and how it's changing. Now, in order to do this better, my PhD wasn't complete until I created the forest monitoring tool. The forest monitoring tool is an open access, open source tool that allows practitioners to understand the change in their forest. I hope this tool will allow users to understand how their forests are changing. And so with this, I hope you take this seed and plant it. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Christopher. Another story I have to say this until this time, right? So my uh, son in grade four, I think, middle of January came home, Dada, I have homework, you need to help me. I'm like what, I need to go count migrating birds in January, middle of January. His teacher, I don't understand, he gave it to him, right? I live not far from Tommy Thompson Park or the Leslie Spit. So I took him down there and we sat, it was freezing cold, <laughs> freezing, freezing cold. We sat for 45 minutes waiting for birds. <laughs> I think we counted two. He was quite excited, he wrote it down in his book. And they were driving home and we stopped at the traffic lights uh, near my house and there was a power line with 50 itch pigeons. <laughs> and he's like, eight, nine, ten, ten. <laughs> all right, he counted all the pigeons and counted them as migrating birds. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I have a strong memory of Thomas Thompson Park. It's a, it's a great place and uh, thanks for your research on that. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Samad Elias Nian Chan, who is uh, doing their PhD in uh, uh, computer science under the supervision of Dr. Mana Al-Lafli. 
uh, sorry, Alal fee. And the title of their presentation is, Are you sure you're safe on your own, in your own home? Another one that worries me here. So, are you sure you're safe in your own home? Well, many homes, including yours, might have a smart camera, a smart bulb, or a sprinkler system that makes your lawn more greener, right? Um, these are all examples of smart home devices. And that's what my research is all about. But we'll get to that later. Let's hear a story for now. In the late 2000s, a group of hackers, the bad guys, came together and created a camera, a camera with software with bad code. And the way a camera works, it's a computer that connects to the internet. For you to be able to see what the camera is seeing, it has to be able to connect to the internet. And let's say the camera is installed in your home. It connects to your Wi-Fi network, the same Wi-Fi network that your phone and your laptops are connected to. Well, the bad code was in a, made in a way that the code spreads to any device that's connected to the network, like your phone. And let's say you, on, a, on the long weekend, you decide to go to your aunt's house, the code would spread to her camera, to her devices. And this goes on. It spreads like a plague. And so um, the very thing that's supposed to save you, the cameras, are now used to spread fear. The code actually fetches all your data, all your private data, like maybe the darkest secrets that you have written up on your notes app, like your Dear Diary moments, and sends it back to, your bad, to the bad guys. And that's scary, right? Um, so I ask again, are you sure you're safe in your own home? My research focuses on being the hero here, the savior of the universe. Well, to some of us, our homes are our universe, so it makes sense. Um, yeah, my research creates a software that uses an AI algorithm. The AI algorithm is called the reinforcement learning. The more it gets closer to finding the vulnerabilities, it gets rewarded. And the more it gets further away, it gets rewarded less. And by hacking at ourselves, by knowing our vulnerabilities, we are one step ahead from the hackers. And that's how we plan to save our homes. By safeguarding our homes, uh, you get to be safe in the one place that you trust. And I get to fulfill my one dream, my childhood dream of being a superhero. It's, it's a win-win. So, and that's the mission, to make you feel assured that you're actually safe in your own home. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. You had me quite worried there until the two and a half minute mark that you weren't going to answer that question as to whether I'm safe or not. So thanks for that. It's quite a relief. Um, our ne uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Hemansho Bargav, um, who is doing their master's thesis in mechanical and industrial engineering under the supervision of Dr. Deborah Fells. And their presentation title is, What Was That? Supervising AI in Live Captioning. I want you to imagine something for me. Imagine you're a deaf parent. You raised your child, and like every immigrant parent, they became, you're hoping for them to become valedictorian, and they actually did. But they study overseas, so you're attending the convocation virtually. So you're using YouTube Live and captions on YouTube. The problem is, if you use YouTube captions, they kind of suck. But it's not fair. All they have to capture this special, very special moment is just the captions and nothing else. So what do you do? Well, for three and a half million Canadians, this is unfortunately the reality. You only have so much to do. You can only use captions because you don't have interpreters available. It's timely, so it's, right, it's costly, and it's expensive. So instead, we can use AI. If you think about it, what happens with planes now? They have autopilot, the computer does the flying, and the pilot just monitors, makes sure things are okay. We can see the same thing with AI. The AI can generate the raw transcripts, so just a little, a little bit, and then the captioner comes in, monitors, makes sure things are okay, and corrects the captions as necessary. So when you do that, you, have, you leverage the efficiency of the AI, which doesn't get tired because captions are a very, very stressful task. And if you event like this, maybe an hour or two, you'll need maybe three or four captioners. So more captioners than the hours. It's not exactly nine to five. It's very, very stressful. So in order to make things better, what you can do is you take the AI, it produces a transcript, like I said, and the captioner just monitors, supervises. So that's what I did. I conducted a human study with 21 people. They came in, used an AI software, 
and correct the captions as they went along. While I did that, I measured their stress levels and I interviewed them just to get an overall experience and how they liked the premise. Fortunately, it worked. I got it to work and everyone was happy. They did want more control over the AI, so we need to kind of monitor that human AI relationship. But the point is that we saw 30% reduction in stress and fatigue overall, which is enormous for a very stressful job. And although they did want more control, they did mention that they think AI is inevitable. And with this, they get to keep their jobs. But most importantly, humans have a cultural understanding. AI doesn't. It's starting to replace creativity, which we didn't expect. It's getting better, but it doesn't have that cultural understanding. It doesn't know how deaf participants will be, sorry, deaf viewers will be watching their content. Humans do. So we can use the human understanding, the AI efficiency, and combine them. When designed for disability, we raise all bars. Captions are used for people with second languages and in noisy environments. I always leave them on. So we want to think about using AI to augment human abilities, not replace them, because we're still very much a part of the equation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hemanshu. Um, I think we're seeing a common theme here that even though AI can be scary, uh, risky, um, and produce some um, threats to us, um, it also has a lot of value uh, to help us a lot with dealing with both that, but um, everyday uh, challenges with, that we have in general. So thanks for that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Maryam L. Tuki, who uh, did doing their master's uh, MRP project in urban development um, under the supervision of uh, Pamela Robinson, <laughs> Dr. Pamela Robinson. And the presentation title is The Spatiality of Success. Thank you all for being here. So when you think of a successful city, a sustainable city, or maybe a, a city with a strong sense of community, where does your mind take you? Maybe Amsterdam for its bike culture, or Vancouver for its sustainability, or maybe even New Orleans for its strong sense of community. But what if I told you that informal settlements, or what the mainstream dubs as the slums, actually have all of these qualities? So formerly trained planners like myself try their best to design new urban spaces that are vibrant and sustainable that people can live and work in. But despite our best efforts, no city on this earth is without these unplanned informal settlements. And it's ultimately because these new master plans that we create seem to not be meeting like our needs, like affordable housing, which is a very hot topic right now. So what secrets can we learn from these informal settlements and how they developed to be so successful and apply that to our own designs so that we can ensure affordable and sustainable urban spaces for all of us? And that's why I studied Manshayat Nasser in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, this is colloquially known as Garbage City in my home country of Egypt. It's an informal settlement um, in the center of the city that is completely like enclosed within itself. There, almost 80% of all of Cairo's garbage is collected, sorted, and recycled by a self-organized community that lives, works, and sustains itself in equilibrium. Essentially, this place is an epitome of economic sustainability with affordable housing and other successful qualities. So I begin by using um, urban morphology analysis, which is basically a method that essentially just physically observes the changes over time of a place's physical characteristics, like its buildings or its roads, um, over a span of time to understand how the community in those spaces have essentially built a city for themselves based on their needs and their capabilities. And after that, I collected high quality satellite images over a time span of about 30 years um, of Manshayat Nasir and then hand traced all the roads and the buildings and other elements so that I can better understand how this community created the successful space that they live in right now. And from there, I learned a lot. So for instance, by looking at the width of the streets, I was able to discern whether they used it only for cars or if the streets were narrow enough for people to socialize in, for example, thus building community. When I looked at the changes in the buildings over time, I learned that like in Manshayat Nasir, as is similar in informal settlements all over the world, there is a very distinct mix of land uses as opposed to the separate land uses that we are very familiar with in Western cities where like work lives here and homes live here and they never mix. So
So with these assessments, these general kind of assessments, we look, um, we learn that, oh, oh no, it's done. <laughs> Should I keep going? All right, bye. Thank you, uh, Miriam. Um, very important work on, uh, on urban settings. Um, <laughs> And it, a thing that I grew up in as well, so um, it's nice to see some new insight into uh, urban um, um, topology and, and, and how that uh, relates to uh, sustainable living. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is uh, Maryam Hassanpour, uh, who is doing their PhD in uh, civil engineering under the supervision of Dr. Bhagwant Parsad. Uh, presentation title is No More Waiting for Crashes to Happen. Picture this, you're sitting at home flipping through channel when you see a news report pops out. It's about a tragic accident when a car ran over a pedestrian in an intersection. As you watch, you can't wonder. Police conducted post-collision analysis and uncovered a few contributing factors, such as short side distance, some issues related to geometric design of the road. So as you watch, you can't uh, help but wonder, what's the point? It feels like too little, too late. So they, you ponder if there could be a better way to identify dangerous intersection before a crash actually happens. I'm here to tell you that it's possible using a method called surrogate measures of safety. This method used near misses, near collision captured by camera as a surrogate me measure instead of crashes. So these near miss misses or near collisions termed traffic conflict are most likely associated with crash occurrence. In this way, we can avoid the need for more pedestrian crashes to happen since we can use these near misses to predict crashes. But there is a problem. To date, most researchers focus solely on frequency of crashes without providing information about their severity. Knowing the severity of a crash, whether, whether in, it involves injury, fatality, or it's just property damage, is an essential information for safety analysis. In our research, we are trying to fill this gap and solve this problem by proposing a new machine learning methods that integrates crash severity and frequency indicators. In the process, we are learning interesting enough from the method used in aviation safety. The results of our research are promising as we uncover that there is an association between this safety index and crash severity levels. In this way, not only we can predict how many crashes might happen in an intersection, we can also provide information about their severity levels. So in summary, we can use only one day traffic conflict data and then predict the number of crashes and severity of them for future. So we can potentially predict and identify dangerous intersection and for the future, which help us to identify them and save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam. Um, and a very important uh, piece of research given that our urban settings are becoming more and more crowded. And it reminds me of a crash I had in an intersection as a bicyclist with a pedestrian, uh, an intersection that I think has a lot of crashes and severity would be interesting to see with that. Uh, if you're curious, Dundas and Sherburn was the intersection. Um, our uh, next speaker is uh, Omar Nastrat. Uh, Omar is uh, doing his uh, PhD uh, in physics uh, in the camp and medical physics um, field. Uh, supervised by uh, Dr. Michael Kolios, and the uh, presentation title is Detecting Viruses with Light and Sound. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on. Coughing? Are you sick? Do you have COVID? Four years ago, when the COVID-19 pandemic began, these are all the questions we were asking ourselves anytime we heard someone cough. And we had good reason to ask these questions. This is a new virus, a new pandemic. Everyone was sick, it was spreading like crazy. So what did we do? Well, we masked up, we got tested, we all sneezed after the tests, we quarantined, a whole bunch of different things. So 
what could we have done better? That's where my work comes in. I'm trying to find a better way to address COVID-19, especially today. Just a couple months ago, we had the year-round high for the cases. So what can we do that's better? Well, the solution is using light and sound to detect viruses. Now, COVID-19 is transmitted through the air. So someone who is sick with COVID coughs. The droplets that they expel from a cough or a sneeze contains the virus in them actually itself. Now, if someone's healthy, the droplets don't have the virus in them. So if we use, using my technique, uh, it's, I, my technique is using photoacoustics to be able to differentiate between the two. Essentially what that is is light and sound used to differentiate whether or not the uh, droplets have the virus in them. So I have, a, in a general sense, a very high energy laser that blasts these droplets in the open air and in doing so, the droplets ever so slightly expand and contract due to heating. Now when this happens, a sound is actually produced. Now that sound isn't loud enough for us to hear, but it is something that we can detect using specialized sensors. Now, what we've determined through early experiments is that this sound actually changes depending on what's actually in that droplet itself. So if there's a virus-like material, it actually produces a different sound compared to a droplet that doesn't have the virus-like material in it. <clears throat> now, it's in the very much early stages of this work, the underlying physics, we're still working it out, but I like to compare what we're doing to Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. If you don't know who he is, he's this wizard, he's got a big beard, he's got a big staff with a light on it, and he uses it to sort of show around what's going on in the dark areas, and that's pretty much what we're doing. We're shining a light on the danger that's directly in front of us. We don't have demons in the dungeon here, we have viruses, something that's a lot more dangerous and frankly a lot more real. Uh, and what we're doing is really differentiating between whether or not that virus is in front of us or if it's not in front of us at all. So with this technique, we can really detect whether the virus is in the room at this moment. We can know exactly when and where to mask up. And ultimately, we can determine whether or not these viruses shall not pass into our bodies. Thank you. <laughs> All right, some humor in the middle of that. Uh, full disclosure here, uh, Omar, I'm on his supervisory committee and I could see little bits of memories of supervisory committee meetings as he was speaking. So sorry about that for being here. Um, but uh, very interesting work and thank you for that. So our next speaker is Alia Patan, who is doing their master's thesis in molecular science under the supervision of Dr. Ra uh, Darius uh, Rakas. The uh, title is Making Vitamin D Tests More Inclusive. Mr. Sun has been shining down on us this week, so I hope everyone's enjoying the beautiful weather and getting that vitamin D. Lately on TikTok and Instagram and other social media platforms, taking vitamin D supplements has been highly advertised and rightfully so. It plays a critical role in enhancing immunity and contributing to bone and cardiovascular health. But it is critical for individuals who are pregnant, diagnosed with osteoporosis, autoimmune disorders, and metabolic diseases for them to stay on top of vitamin D testing to manage their conditions well. But something really interesting related to sex and gender-based analysis is that over the past 30 years, when vitamin D has been measured, it's been measured when bound to vitamin D binding protein. What if I told you that the four people here had the same levels of vitamin D, yet when they get tested in a lab, look at how the results vary drastically. Now the problem with measuring this protein is that it is highly variable amongst the African populations. However, the current test, they don't account for these variations as they are selective for the vitamin D binding protein found in Caucasian Western populations. Also, this protein is highly variable. Uh, sorry, this protein is highly affected by the presence of hormones with women who are undergoing menopause or who are pregnant. Now, this is where my research fits in. I measured free, unbound vitamin D for good quality results and unaffected by all of these factors mentioned earlier. I measured vitamin D using an immunoassay, which relies on the ability of an antibody to bind to a specific, specific structure on the vitamin D molecule. Now, sorry. 
um, on the vitamin D molecule. Um, so its principle is similar to that of a glucose test, where everything is performed on a small test strip, decreasing liquid handling without sacrificing analytical sensitivity. I was able to successfully measure different concentrations of vitamin D using an electrochemical reaction. Now, we can translate this principle towards a point-of-care self-testing platform, point-of-care self-testing platform uh, to bridge the gap between diagnostic measures and disease monitoring and management. Now, developing this point-of-care assay can improve access to those in remote and underserved communities and not only serve those at, at home, not only serve at home platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alia. Um, remind everyone to take their vitamin D. I do. It's, an, it's one of the outcomes of my bicycle accident was my doctor tested me for vitamin D and said I was deficient. Maybe my uh, vitamin D binding proteins were not at the same level, so maybe I should test with you again. Uh, but I'm taking my vitamin Ds now. Um, we have our uh, last speaker um, for the event, uh, Rezwana Raman, who's doing their master's thesis in nursing supervised by Dr. Uh, Jennifer Lapum, and their presentation title is Veiled Threats. Hi, everyone. Imagine walking into a room where you're instantly recognized, but you're misunderstood. The fabric around your head speaks volumes before you can even utter a word. This is the reality for many Muslim women in Canada navigating the healthcare system. As a visibly Muslim woman myself, I embarked on my thesis exploring the encounters of eight visibly Muslim women and their he healthcare encounters. I use narrative research, which is essentially storytelling. The demographics of my participants varied in terms of age, ethnicity, and place of birth, yet my narrative through their journeys revealed five themes. Each of these themes relate to a body part or a sensation. Like the hijab, which is physical, it serves a deeper purpose. These themes actually also serve a deeper purpose. So jumping right into it, theme number one is the fingerprint. Inspired by an excerpt from one of my participants, theme number one speaks on the unique preferences that exist among this group of women. This is not a monolithic group of women. Instead, many preferences that I learned about differ from my own. Theme number two is the membrane, and the membrane speaks on a selective barrier in which healthcare professionals hold certain discourses about Muslim women to be true, even though they are furthest from the truth for my participants. And theme number three speaks on the emotional core of visibly Muslim women's experiences. Fear, which is what I'm experiencing, and courage are profoundly different emotional states, yet both of these elicit the same physiological response. They make your heart pound. And a paradox of visibility is theme number four, unseen. And this speaks on how, despite the marked visibility of Muslim women, a lot of their healthcare needs go unseen. And last but not least, when individual care transcends stereotypes, you're left with individuals who feel heard, like their stories are listened to and acknowledged. So, this is not just an academic endeavor, this is a call to action. This challenges healthcare providers, policymakers, and society at large to question what they know, to listen intently, to see the person behind this identity, and tailor care in a way that respects the diverse human experience. Let us not merely observe the differences that exist among us. Instead, let us listen to each other's stories and engage in those stories. In doing so, we shift away from a healthcare system that homogenizes the care of a group of women and rather cherishes individuality. I end my presentation with a poem I have written about my participants as a part of my thesis. Their narratives resound, breaking through the noise, shattering misconceptions, empowering their voice. A symphony of tales, they have said their piece, and for through their storytelling, may health meet peace. I thank you all for listening. Thank you uh, very, uh, very much, uh, Razwana. Um, I think our last two presentations sort of highlight the importance of diversity um, in, in healthcare and, uh, and what we can do to uh, improve it and ad address, uh, bring more inclusivity and less bias in, in healthcare. So uh, very important work and thanks for that. So um, that concludes our presentations for today. Let's just do a, have another round of applause for all of today's presenters.
And uh, I'd like to um, thank all the people behind the scenes that worked on this event. Um, staff at YSGPS, staff at many other units who also came together. Um, so thank you to all of them. So a round of applause. <laughs> and while many of them did, did it's on, right? while many of them did a lot of work on this, I do want to highlight one particular person who did the most and uh, we, does a great job with this, Leslie Mutik, who's there. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Great. So um, we're going to take a short uh, break, uh, a short recess while our judges deliberate, and then we'll come back for the awards. Um, in the meantime, I'd ask the presenters to please cast your votes for the Participant Choice Award. And everyone else, um, including the last set of present presenters, please help yourself to any refreshments you want, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, stay seated for now, please. Sorry. Participants, okay. Everybody else can walk around. All right. That was the extra piece of paper. Yeah. 
pretty not right. I don't know. Somebody has it over there. Uh, you are not exactly free. We need you after the result. Yes, go, go, go. We're, we're Plastic envelope? Okay. I did. I think that I just threw her tally sheet in the garbage, so <laughs> I don't think it really makes a difference. Somebody gave us their submission on a tally sheet. No, I don't know what the tally sheet looks like. It's just tally sheet on it. Okay, somebody might have, I might have mixed up the sheets of paper. Oh. Oh, here it is. Oh, is it in there still? Basically, we're just going to try to find a spot in between people. That's great. One way. Sorry for pointing, guys. I'm never going to remember your names. Um, great. Let's have oh, sorry. too far back. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, can you take a step this way? Uh, Samad, come this way. Come, come over. Come, come. Anything just like that? Switch spots. Switch spots. <laughs> there you go. Bring your shoulders this way. Okay. Looking right through here. Shoulders this way a bit. Great. Looking through. Looking through. Looking through. Just because I don't want to be right here. Great. Okay. So, yeah. Was your one hundred dollars? Okay. At the end, you, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. At the end, it'd be great. I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> So make sure I can see everybody. Okay, great. Yes, everyone's face. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more. One more. I know it seems a little. Would you mind just going a little bit more? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Just because we were too far off the stage. Have you? Great. Great. Okay. So take a seat. Put your shoulder in front of his right there. Wait. No, you're good, Christopher. Okay. Um, come this way. What's your name? Reswana. Reswana? Yes. Come this way. Now turn your shoulder. Oh, so what do you do? Just go this way. Yeah, turn this way. Push, push, push. You're okay. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. It's just so we're angled so we can see everybody. Okay, I think I've got that right there. Yeah, awesome. Great. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Don't mind us. Yeah, we're just going to get out a little bit. I want you to look like you're not. Yeah, here we go. Excellent. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm just going to take a few. So looking straight at my camera. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's okay. Awesome. Great. And then maybe we'll just say something like, 3MT, you're like, ah. <laughs> 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 TMU, TMU. <laughs> great, great, great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the question part or the
just want to hear some. Yeah. 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 This is not me announcing winners. Everybody gets one of these. We're still waiting for the judges. Uh, we can still rain.
I'll use this mic. Do you want to come up on stage? Yeah, we're going to do this. And do this on stage. Ah, all right. You want to come away from the light? The instruction was to step in this section. There you go, right? Is it, it's still on me, isn't it? Oh, well, I'll step away. That's okay. It's all right. Good. Okay. So, uh, hang on a second. Okay. So, uh, Thank you everyone for coming back and paying attention to this important and last part of it. So I'd like again to thank our judges uh, for taking on the difficult task of deciding between uh, so many presentations. So thank you again, judges. Okay, so uh, the, I'll start with the participant choice, participants choice award. And so this is a choice by the participants. Um, for the, who they think is the best uh, presentation. And uh, the award of uh, $250 goes to Jordan Carrillo Zurita. Come on up. Come on up. Congratulations. Do you want to come up here? And uh, next is the uh, runner-up award of $500, and that goes to Alia Patan. Come on up. All right, here we go. The uh, first place winner receives $1,000 and all expenses paid trip to Aurelia. <laughs> Before you laugh so much, okay, don't, I'll be there as well, okay? It's so a little bonus for that, okay? So <laughs> it's not in my notes, but I realize I should mention that. I'll be there too. There you go. Oh, it's even better. Uh, up in the ante here. So uh, our first place uh, winner is Jordan Korea, Korea Zurita. Okay. Congratulations. All right, so uh, congratulations to our winners. Thank you to all the participants, our judges, the staff, everyone who worked so hard to put this together. So uh, thanks again. So uh, um, stay tuned for details about the Ontario 3MT competition. Um, our university has historically done quite well in that competition, so I, I expect and look forward to that as well. Uh, for all our participants, uh, please uh, stay around to receive your certificate of participation. They already have it. They have it? Okay. All right. Okay. 
So you're welcome to stick around and finish the uh, refreshments. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here.